Hello, I'm Devin, and you're listening to Tools and Craft. Today, I'm talking to Suzanne Gianni, a musician and composer who's been writing and performing electronic music since the 1970s. She's been nominated for a Grammy five times, and she's been dubbed the Diva of the Diode. I'm excited to talk to Suzanne because music is an especially intimate kind of creative process. Suzanne has had decades of experience working with an instrument called the bukla, which looks less like a conventional instrument than a piano or violin, and more like an aircraft's instrument panel. It's such a unique interface for the kind of work she's doing, so I'm excited to hear about how it's shaped the work she does, and how it felt to be one of the earliest pioneers experimenting with this instrument. So Suzanne, thank you for taking the time to chat. Lovely, thank you, Devin. It's going to be very fun, um, and I, I hope we both learn some things in this conversation too. So my, my first question is, how would you redesign sheet music? I was brought up as a classical composer, but sheet music is not my medium right now. I do know that sheet music has advanced over the ages. I was sitting in a subway recently and next to a conductor who was studying a score on his iPad and able to make notes as he you know, went through the pages, right on the score. So even though I personally have not had experience with these new possibilities, I know that traditional music scoring has come into the digital era in a very important way. My work now with the book club is not in any way traditional and my scoring techniques or what I use to enable somebody else to perhaps uh, recreate my composition on the bukla is more of a documentation, you know, where I list the sequences used, I list the patch diagram, I list the movements that I make in a performance in order to facilitate the composition. So it's a different world completely. I feel fortunate that I have lived in both of these worlds, that I grew up in a classical world, and that then I, you know, transitioned into a a digital world, because it does give me some perspective on that. So help me imagine what the documentation looks like for your bukla music and your bukla compositions. Well, as a matter of fact, I have a paper that I wrote in 1976 that I call the bukla cookbook that documents my early practice in performing the bukla. And this was, you know, to satisfy a grant that I got from the National Endowment. And it is available on my website. And it's it's quite interesting. And I have used it myself. When I came back to performing on the bukla, I consulted that paper. And so what it does, it outlines the raw materials that are used in the performance. First, it gives you the tone rows for the sequencer. Then it gives you the patch diagram. Then it gives you examples of moving from one, you know, circumstance to another, performance actions. And this is very typical of how you communicate music. Um, So that's called Report to National Endowment or the Buchla Cookbook. It is on my website and you can look at it. It's a 40 page paper. Because technology is such a fluid world, nothing stays quite the same. And so the chance of having, uh, you know, from year to year even, the same tools, uh, you know, they, they change constantly. So you're chasing a moving target when you're trying to describe an electronic music performance, the modules can change, you know, the actual hardware changes. And in the short run, recently I was working at Berkeley College of Music, where I go a couple of times a year to work in their music technology department. I'm called a scholar of electronic music there. And we were uh, developing a concert for Buchla and orchestra. And we created a scoring system, and that involved like a lot of detail. So if some of the processing was in an app on the iPad, say for the H9s, you know, the the reverb or the, um, 
various delays or whatever you want to use flanging on this processor, then we could take photos of the patch and a photo of the bukla and also list. It's, it's, an, it's really a Herculean task to think that this composition can be reproduced. But in fact, if you follow the detail, you can get most of the way there. Live performance is also, you know, it's not like a piano piece where you're recreating a given set definition of the composition, you know, the notes. It is a little bit more freeform. It's like jazz. You know, what would you do if you wanted to reproduce a jazz composition? You'd start really with the fundamentals. You'd start with the, what I call the raw materials. and you know, nowadays we have tools like just recording. You could say, and here is the recording of that jazz performance. And you have a document. Does that allow you to reproduce it by performing yourself? Well, certainly helps to get you there. It's so interesting to hear how the bukla is different from conventional instruments, because I think while certainly you could tune a guitar in a different way and therefore change the whole instrument, or you could even remove some strings or there's 12 string guitars and so on. Typically, people think of a guitar as a pretty stable instrument that you don't con configure too much. Everyone who plays guitar roughly knows how to say play the same type of guitar. It sounds like the bukla is much more configurable. Uh, not just configurable, but it's like inherent in the instrument itself. For our listeners who may, may not know what a bukla is, could you give a brief description of the instrument? Well, Don Bukla from Berkeley, California, was credited with having invented the first analog modular musical instrument in 1963. I met Don in the late 60s and went to work for him. The essence of this instrument is that it is voltage controllable. It is modular, and that means that it is a collection of, of pieces that you assemble, and each one has a specific function and capability. So you'll have a module that is a filter. You'll have a module that is a, a, an oscillator a white noise uh, source. You'll have an envelope generator. You'll have a gate for processing the, the envelope or the amplitude of the sound. And all of these special function modules you choose, uh, you could have comb filters and the, you know keyboard controllers, but not conventional keyboard. I mean, let's just say that the Boo Club and Don Boo Club envisioned a new performance instrument that did not use a traditional interface. A traditional interface was the keyboard, the black and white keyboard. And that was used in, say, the Moog to make people, you know, more comfortable in, you know, relating to it as a musical instrument. But actually attaching that kind of interface as I say, short-circuited the understanding of the machine completely. So the essence of this machine is voltage control. And a keyboard certainly does produce a voltage, but it is very limited in the sense that if you touch a key, you get, you know, you get one voltage for pitch. You might get one for a, a dynamic or whatever, but it's it's a very limited way of accessing the power of the machine, the potential power of the machine. So uh, Don Buchel was an expert at designing interfaces. From the beginning, he had a spatial interface. So the music was immersive, it was quadraphonic, and this was done with voltage control. You didn't sit there and you know, wave your finger in the air to do it, although you could. But you could integrate the movement of the sound with the actual generation of the sound. So it was rhythmically integrated and uh, just married to the actual music. I am a devotee. I mean, I worked for Bukla 
1969. Uh, no, 1970 was when I went to work for him. When I finished my master's degree at the University of California, Berkeley, I went and uh, started soldering instruments at his industrial design studio at the waterfront in Oakland, you know, with my passion being to actually get one of these instruments. And I, I feel so fortunate because I was really, I was really in this intimate contact with this brilliant inventor at the moment that he was crystallizing a vision for a per- electronic performance instrument, the 200 the 200 series. Uh, He also designed other interfaces. He had the marimba lumina, which was uh, modeled on a a marimba interface. He had uh, the thunder and lightning, which was modeled on light wands and the motion of light in space. So he was, I call him the Leonardo da Vinci of electronic music instrument design. And we still have so much to learn from him. He's gone now. So he died about five years ago. But his instruments do continue uh, to be available for investigation. Not easily, but they're there. And I'm out, you know, pounding the pavement and performing all over the world to show how we did it in the 60s and 70s. What were some of the insights that he had about instrument design and the interface that musicians use to play their instruments that he introduced to the scene with his innovations? What he did was he started at the beginning, at ground zero. He said, you know, these machines have an inside and an outside. The inside is the mechanism that's going to produce the tech, you know, the technology, uh, the, the result. The outside is where the human comes in. What is the size of a human hand? What is, you know, how can I make an instrument that is both compact so that in fact it can be transported to perform live? You know, some of the early instruments were huge. They were stuck in studios. They couldn't be moved. And Don thought, well, for a performance instrument, I need to maximize that uh, intersection of the human needs for dimension and the needs of a portable instrument. So he just went really to the basics. When he designed a, a keyboard, it didn't have a physical you know, depression, because in in electronics, that didn't make sense. You didn't need to strike a string. You were closing a, a switch closure. And so he designed a keyboard, really, that sh- if you pick up your hand and just hold it in front of you, you'll see that it is at an angle. If you put both hands up in front of you, those fingers are not going straight out in front of you. They're kind of tilted in, right? That is the relaxed position of your hand. If you go to a piano keyboard, you're asked to, you know, make your hands straight on, you know, to to in, to go into this, you know, straight interface. But in electronics, so what he did was he took that position of the hand and designed a touch plate, a keyboard that doesn't look like a traditional keyboard and respects the natural position of the hand. He did this in all of his design. He said, what does a performer need? A performer needs to know what's going on inside the machine. So a lot of the early instruments were just opaque. You know, you didn't have any communication about you know, maybe you'd get communication about what stage a sequencer was on, but it was very limited. And Don's designs had hundreds of lights and each light, you know, communicated what was going on inside the instrument. What was the intensity of a voltage? When was something triggered? Uh, what was the speed of a, uh, of a sequence? 
um, all these things allowed the machine to come to life. It was like you knew what was going on inside. And therefore, you know, your participation with the machine came alive. You didn't have uh, questions about what was going on. You could interact live in the moment with the machine. Uh, so that was very much a Don Buchla concept. And so I, I just say, don't take anything for granted when you're designing. Really take the problem apart all the way to the beginning, especially in technology. A lot of times we look at what the technology can do and we start there. But that's not, if you're, if you're working with the human, that's not a good starting place. You need to start with the, with the human and then design the technology around that. So, uh, you know, some of the new electronic instruments, Euro rack, have a very diminutive size. And I, I'm sad about that because it's very difficult to interact in those, uh, you know, with those modules because they're so dense and condensed. So, you know, that's just one example of where your brain might take you if you don't go automatic pilot with what's being done already. Bukla didn't follow, he led. This is difficult to do because the market wants you to follow. And it's hard to make a statement that is not popular right away. But uh, I think that's the job of, of designing now really is to respect total originality uh, in, from, the, from the beginning. So that's my speech. What, what characterized the people who saw the value of the Bukla from the beginning, even though it wasn't popular initially? You know, what happened really was that we just lost sight of voltage control. You know, the, for instance, uh, the Moog was used for switched on Bach. And people started to think of the instruments as being about sound. Oh, it can sound like a flute. It can sound like a whatever. You know, they became obsessed with the quality of the timbre. And then they weren't thinking in terms of, you know, unique electronic control voltage uh, compositional techniques. So you had um, Switched on Bach, which was a brilliant work, but again, it was a Baroque composition. Then you had rock and roll people using electronics as just a you know, so a keyboard player could cut through the way a guitar player could. You know, if you could make a sound like uh, Keith Emerson on the keyboard that rivaled, you know, the awesome sound of an electric guitar, you could take center stage. But again, that was keyboard work. So everybody thought of the synthesizer as something that could synthesize other sounds, make copies of sounds or make new sounds, but you know, in the mold of existing sounds. The other thought about electronic music in those early days was that it was otherworldly or alien or space, space-like. You know, it just was something extraterrestrial. And uh, that also was very limited. The real power of those instruments uh, could be found by just working with them. It's the most beautiful instrument because it's a feedback system. Don gave so many options and so much depth to the possibilities. You know, you could connect it in so many ways. No two people would play that instrument alike. 
if you spent enough time with the instrument, you would discover how to interact with it and play it without bringing a preconceived idea of what it was, without coming to it saying, well, it's a keyboard instrument. I mean, all of that is fine. There were many interfaces made in my, you know, historic uh, evolution. You know, they made uh, trumpet interfaces for electronics. They made guitar interfaces. Then everybody had a way of adapting their early techniques, their ins- traditional acoustic instrument techniques to access electronic sound. But none of those adaptations were focused on what I loved, which was the, you know, the new world of electronic music composition via control voltages. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think so. You're saying like the people had all of these ideas about what an instrument was. They said it sounds like a trumpet or it sounds like a violin or something that they recognized. And while the synthesizers could do that, they also had this much wider potential that was a brand new sound that that you were able to bring to the table. Yeah, uh, not exactly a sound. What I always say wasn't about the sound. It was about the way the sound could move. You know, with voltage control, you were outside the limitations of your physical body, right? I mean, up until that time, uh, people were trying to dazzle with their performances. Look how fast I can play. Look how many, you know, how, look how loud I can play the drums. Mm-hmm. Look, you know, what, and, and, and all of that, you know, dazzle, razzle, dazzle, uh, you know, in the hands of an electronic instrument were, were moot, as you said, because I could do, you know, I could make sounds move faster than a human could play them. And they could, you know, move around the room. I mean, it was just a whole other realm that instead of just depending on your physical limitations or the acoustic limitations of an instrument, suddenly you had an instrument that wasn't defined by its limitations. And that was exciting. That's fascinating. Yeah. This is, this is a a, a poor and loose analogy, but I, I could imagine that back when people used travel agents as their primary way of scheduling travel, travel agents would, you know, be like, I can respond to my clients within two minutes every single time. And that that would be incredibly impressive to respond to every email or phone call you got instantly. With travel agents, like, I mean, as soon as you end up having kayak.com or Google Flights or whatever, if you had to wait for two minutes for for the page to load, uh, (laughs) it's it's a qualitatively different thing. Um, Now, of course, this is a much, it has a much more artistic aspect. How did that end up changing the things that you ended up composing. I went uh, passionately, I I fell in love with that machine. And so even though I was classically trained, I, when I worked with Buchla, I stopped using uh, any kind of piano interface, any kind of mechanical keyboard, because I realized the danger that people would think of it as a keyboard instrument. And that was the biggest danger to Don to the understanding of Don Buchla's instrument. So even though he did make a mechanical keyboard at some time, it was never used, you know, as a piano keyboard. I mean, it had a lot of options. When I played the Buchla, I I stopped playing the piano because I couldn't be in those two worlds simultaneously. And I'm in the same place today. So for five years now, I've been performing on the Buchla, the 200E, and I have not touched the piano. There's a kind of internal switch in me from the old days where the keyboard was the danger of, you know, it blocked the understanding. And even today, I, I distance myself. I, I have a piano here, but I haven't, I haven't played it in five years. And just prior to that, I was touring on piano. What do you think would happen if you tried to mix and match and play one, you know, play the bukla on Mondays and the piano on Tuesdays? 
Well, you know, I have been approached by, I met a wonderful pianist in France on my last tour and she's, she's just magnificent. And she's been performing some of my piano compositions. And I'm thinking, you know, it'd be, she wants to work with me as, as an electronic, you know, person. So I think that I will mix them, but uh, not me. I mean, I'll give that piano department to, to somebody else and uh, see what happens. I, you know, Dom Buchla's wife, when he died, was a pianist, Nanique, and uh, she she was also French, and they did do some performances together, where he would sit at his Buchla and she would be at the piano, and he would maybe process her playing, or trigger something. You know, there are millions of ways of integrating the outside world into the Buchla. Whatever that outside world is, it could be a piano, it could be anything. Uh, you know, once you're in 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 the uh, technological domain, the currency is very available. You know, you need a trigger. You can be a dancer and 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 trigger something on the floor, and that'll play the music. You can, you know, there are all kinds of ways of interacting with the outside world. Are there any particular performances that, that Don and his wife did uh, that you would recommend we, we check out and possibly link to from the transcript? Well, I, I would just uh, see if you can find, I know there was one he did in San Francisco. There were a couple that were just brilliant. One of them was with the marimba lumina. And this was also demonstrating, uh, you know, the fact that even though the interface was a marimba, actual contact with the what do they call that that you hit in a marimba a, a key uh was not essential so in this performance a woman has a baby carriage and she walks off and on the stage and every time she walks on the stage she puts a part of the marimba in her carriage and walks off with it and at the end you know the marimba player is playing in the air there's, <laughs> there's no piece of gear there at all right? Because it's all done. It's all done uh, electronically. Another piece, oh, Don was so humorous. We all, we were, I was part of this piece. Anyway, we had these huge glasses on that had staff paper, music paper on the, you know, on the uh, lens. And at a certain point, he started a popcorn maker. And our instructions were, When the popcorn starts to leap out of the popcorn maker and crosses your staff paper and creates a a visual note, you play that note. Do you see? I mean, it's completely, completely absurd and charming, but really shows the openness of his creativity. You know, he was unhinged from the expectations of integrating, you know, with what we already knew. He was definitely just original. He was original. It's so fun to to hear about how he's rethinking interfaces and, and what does it mean to make music um, as opposed to just making sounds or, or just playing with, with toys. Um, I definitely remember when, when I was younger learning various instruments, I very much took the instruments as a given that, you know, this is what a guitar is. This is what a baritone is. And, you know, within that, there's a lot of creativity and there's a lot of different ways you could play a baritone. But I never really thought, well, could, could I have creativity at the level of the instrument itself? So it's it's really interesting to, to think about what, what would it look like if, if I wanted to in, innovate on what a baritone looked like? How would I do that? Um, how would I change the interface? How would that change the music that I ended up playing? It's a really challenging uh, exploration because when Buchla was dying and uh, I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? My, my, you know, my inventor is going, because these things are always morphing and changing, you know? And so I thought, well, maybe I'll design a module that I need. And Buchla had taught me that I could design just by, you know, designing the outside. So draw the knobs that you want, what it is you want to interact with, what you need to, you know, control. 
and then let the engineer design the inside. And I, I do believe that this is very much a collaborative process. It is a marriage of an engineer with a performer. And not that they couldn't be the same person, but, you know, you're asking a lot. You know, you don't design the airplane that you fly, but you have certain needs, you know. (laughs) What are some of the modules that you designed and and, uh, use? Well, the one that I am most in love with is called the Multiple Arbitrary Function Generator, otherwise known as the MARF. And this was part of the 200 system and was not part of the 200E. And I had developed, if you look at that Buchla cookbook that's on my website, you'll see that the MARF is an essential tool in controlling a performance live, and it still is. So I needed a MARF. And uh, here's the real crux of the thing. The needs of live performance are a specialized subgroup of all electronic music controls. When you're designing for live performance, you have a set of requirements that is completely separate from other uses of these instruments. Live performance is a special subcategory. So if you're using the instrument in your studio to record and you're overdubbing and you're doing this and that, that's not performance. So live performance is very demanding. I mean, for instance, instead of the MARF, what Buchla had was the DARF. The DARF was not the multiple, it was the dual, dual arbitrary function generator. And in my first comeback performance, which has been released in a quad vinyl called uh, Buchla Concert, I think, I don't, well, I I had the boot club concerts in 1975, which documented the, you know, early performances with the 200. And then I had an album that came out about a few years ago, quad album for my 2016 performance with the 200E. After that concert, I realized what was missing, you know, that my filters didn't have the control voltages that I had in the 200 that my DARF didn't allow me to do octave switching the way I could with the MARF. And all of these real, you know, needs surfaced. And so I had a clone built of the 200 MARF. And I had a clone built of the filter. Uh, There are still a lot of things I miss uh, from the 200. But, you know, I, I... there's a lot of customization that goes into these because you you really do need to, because you can, you can, you know, <laughs> if you need something, you know, I needed a special sequencer uh, just for my spatial control. I wanted a sequencer just for the control voltages for my spatial movement. And so I had somebody build this tiny little sequencer with a, uh, a slope function so that the movement could be very discrete or very continuous and and other things. So if you have ideas, but what I found out was that it's really challenging to design these things. I mean, that's when I, you know, when I really tried to do it myself, I thought, oh my God, you know, this is just not, I worked with an engineer for a year. I thought, you know, I'll I'll get what I need. And it wasn't, it wasn't happening. I mean, every engineer comes with their own history and you have to find an engineer who thinks like you or who has your experience or knows where you're coming from. I'm coming from a tradition of analog modular, you know, instruments that goes back to the source with Don Buchla. It, it's really hard to find an engineer that, that has the familiarity with that. But I have found one. I, d- I did find one. So anyway, my job now is to redesign the MARF. And uh, the Buchla company says they want to call it the SCARF with my initials. 
<laughs> I love these names. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. The, the way you describe your Buchla reminds me more of how I feel about my text editor where I write software than any of the instruments that I've played. Um, I mentioned before, like with, with instruments, I've often felt like I, I've given the, been given this set of constraints and abilities and I get to play within that. Uh, whereas with my, my text editor, I feel like I can make it mine. And it's it's mine to the point where if other people go into my text editor, even if they're very skilled programmers, they don't really know how to use it because I've customized it to a point where they they don't know any of the controls. Um, so it's really, really interesting to hear about uh, a, a musical instrument. Brilliant example. Thank you. It, it makes me wonder, you know, like, what are we missing with more conventional instruments because people can't change them? Uh, or at least not not as easily. You know, there's the, one of the first things I learned in mathematics was that there's no such thing as a, a definition of infinity, that you can have, you know, a, an infinite number of, you know, numbers divisible by three and an infinite number of numbers divisible by nine. And, you know, they're all infinite. So you can say one is bigger than another, or gives you more options than another. But the fact is, it's all infinite. The piano is infinite. There's no limit to what we can discover uh, within the framework of any, you know, closed system. I think that the trick with electronics is to define the closed system to get a grip on how you function within this very open system and uh, you create a frame you know you have to have a framework in which to create we're used to a lot of frameworks we used that artists and photographers adopted a, you know a certain a rectangular format or square format you know, for their images. Now we're dealing in something without any bounds. And we create the bounds. I mean, you have, you know, I have a an Oculus and I can go in there and, you know, get rid of all the edges of everything. And uh, is that a higher level of frame? No, it's just different. You, you still have an infinite number of possibilities and a traditional fame, frame. Uh, so infinite is infinite in all directions. You're talking about uh, sort of getting getting a grip of how open the instrument is with, with the bukla. Is that something that you do on a, a per composition basis where each time you create a brand new framing of how you're going to appro approach the composition? Or is it something where at the beginning when you first learning learn how to do it, you have to create a framing for yourself and then in the future you, you, you operate within that? Well, my frame now is based on my live performances. And so I have a very compact instrument. In the early days, I had a huge 200, but I couldn't have traipsed around the world in it. You know, my sequencer was four panel units or more. My sequencer now is one panel unit. My system now is based on pretty much a set patch which I alter in the process of performing. Oh, the other nice thing about the bukla that I hadn't mentioned before is that uh, besides the size of the panel unit and the, you know, the accommodation of the size of the human hand, he has distinct patch cables and uh, patch points. So there's a lot of color coding, you know, a red banana input is a trigger. A black banana input is a control voltage. An audio is not a banana. It's a it's a mini connector. The the patch cables are color coded according to length. So if I need to grab a short cable, I know which one it is. It's a yellow one or it's an orange one, you know, depending on how short I want it. So all of these feedback systems, you know, are important to notice in the bukla. When you begin composing a new piece, how do you start? What What is the seed that you start with and how do you cultivate it to grow from there? Well, you know, I'm a composer. So I, I compose in a lot of different media. I compose for orchestra. I compose for piano. I compose, you know, in, in, I use other instruments. And I think, you know, it depends on what type of composition you're making. 
how you do it. If I'm doing a piano composition, I could start with two notes. I did a piece, The Velocity of Love, and there were just two notes that triggered the whole thing. And then your job as a composer is to take that little seed, which you noted is a seed, and to explore it and to trust it and to accept it and not to doubt it and to go with it where it wants to go. That's one process of composing. With the bukla, as I say, it's really an organic process of spending time sitting with the machine. And, you know, before my first concert in New York, I, I sat with it for six weeks. I got to New York early and I, I, I worked with the machine 10 hours a day, immersed in the machine, and it grows like an organic plant. You discover things. It's a relationship. So you need to spend time to get to know it. And so that's my approach to electronic composition is to be with the instrument and just, you know, spend time with it and let it evolve. Is it a process that you feel like you can just turn on and get into that headspace and start working on it? And you know that by the end, you'll end up with something that you think is beautiful or whatever, whatever emotion you're trying to capture. Or is it something where, you know, sometimes you feel it and you feel it calling you in a particular direction. And then sometimes it's just not there and it's just not a good time to work on it because you're not getting pulled in that direction. At this stage of my life, I have very, I, I certainly have used inspiration by uh, going to distant places. So one of my formulas for writing was to escape my normal life to travel, to shut off the phone, to shut off contact, to focus. It's all about focusing. And it can be, you know, easier to focus if you get out of your, you know, day-to-day life that has so many demands. I am also, uh, because I've been a, you know, professional composer, I, I can write on demand. If you tell me, you know, I need to do something by three o'clock tomorrow, I I do it. I mean, inspiration, schminspiration. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> it's just a matter of, of doing it, right? So it comes from all directions. My inspiration, you know, on a fundamental level has been the sea, the the ocean. I'm looking at it right now. And, you know, that has been the metaphor for the rhythm and the, you know, whatever that is, the, uh, the spirit where I feel safe, you know, in that vast space, open space. Uh, so that's a lot of my inspiration. A lot of my work now, because I'm so busy, is really done by myself just demanding it of myself. Just do it. So what, one of the contexts that you've worked in for, for a bit of your career was uh, audio logos and background music for brands. I, I don't think I mentioned this at the beginning, but one of the, the, the most memorable things that you've made is Coke's classic pop and pour sound. Mm-hmm. And yes, I, I did drink several cans of Coke while preparing for this interview. I was, I was inspired. <laughs> <laughs> that sound just makes me want to drink a Coke. I can't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> you're so up <laughs> when when you get hired to, to do something like that what information do you need from the client in in order to make a good sound or a piece of music that works well for what they're trying to achieve well in that particular case this is interesting because they had a blank space a lot of times I was hired to do things to picture so there was a visual a t- television commercial and There was a scoring element of marrying the sound or the music to the picture in whatever way that uh, could be done. Uh, But in this case, the Coca-Cola was done in kind of a vacuum. They didn't have a picture. And I, the question, here are the questions I asked. I asked, can you do a sound in this space? I said, yes. I said, do you want it? just for this space? Or do you want to use it in other spaces? In other words, am I doing a sound that fits into this jingle 
that's in the key of E flat? Or do you want to be able to use it any place? And they said, well, we don't know. And, and I think to myself, well, if I can make them a sound that can be used any place, that's much better for me, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> Because it'll get used more. You'll get paid more royalties, presumably. <laughs> right. And it's probably more helpful for them, too. They don't have to it'll find get... new music. <laughs> right. right. So instead of doing a little, you know, electronic melody in that space, I thought, well, what can I do that's musical, but not pitch centered, not key centered? And I thought of bubbles. I thought, you know, those are melodic. They can they can go up, but they're not key centric. You can use those in any context musically. So that was part of the beginning of that, the evolution of that sound. First of all, the bukla, those were things that you could do on the bukla. You know, it had a wonderful bandpass filter. You could take a, a very low frequency and pick off the harmonics. And that was a very musical gesture. And it went up, so it had a certain dynamism. And then you had white noise which was wonderful. To this day, I use the white noise. I can do a whole concert on white noise. And uh, so that was also, you know, part of the sound. But that's just one, uh, and, uh, you know, and it, as it turns out, they did use it every place. But it wasn't an assignment where they said, we want a logo sound that we can use every place. You know, my thinking was how can I maximize the usefulness of this sound? And I think as a sound designer, you, you need to ask all these questions of yourself. You, the people that you're dealing with often have a limited notion of what a sound could be or how they would use it. You know, in, in when I was doing this, computer graphics were just starting. They weren't even they weren't even starting. The first graphics were motion graphics where they did these film frames and they used machines to advance the motion of something. You know, Robert Abel was doing that. And I, you know, I worked with Robert Abel uh, on designing, you know, these graphics needed sound because they came out of the non -text textualized space you know they moved but they moved in in a vacuum and they needed to be the sound needed to marry that visual to give it a, a space to live in and it's still that way you know you have a lot of visual logos and the sound is what defines the space for those visuals. So that's wonderful. You know, now there, there's just such a huge uh, need for sound design in, in this, uh, you know, computer graphic world. You, you've you taken such an expansive view of what an electronic instrument can do. It, it feels like since the 70s, electronic music as a genre has narrowed quite a lot. I mean, of course, there's still a lot of diversity, but I think when most people think what electronic music, they imagine that they're imagining, you know, they go, you go to a club, maybe you take some Molly and, you know, you dance all night long. Mm -hmm. That's very fun for a lot of people and there's nothing wrong with that, but it, it seems like it is um, a narrow view on what electronic music can be. What, why do you think the pop definition of electronic music evolved in that way, leaving out so many other different sounds and styles? One of the essential attributes of electronic music is that you can do it yourself. You know, you can sit there and control the production. You can start from zero and build up something right in your studio. Or, you know, I think a lot of this dance music started with DJs. And those tools, you know, of using turntables and then adding the drum machines and and building up. So all of that is is a use of electronics. And sadly, even the Grammys now, they don't know where to put it. 
you know, their definition of electronic music really is dance music. And yes, that's a huge market, but it, it obscures the, you know, the whole domain of electronic music. For me, you know, one of the things that I loved about electronic music in the beginning was the pure poetry of it. You know, the idea that you were making a sound that could connote an idea. You know, it didn't it didn't exist maybe in the real world, but it represented an idea or a feeling. It was free to be experienced and defined in a new way. I think the kids now, thank goodness for you know the kids because they put the brakes on the whole technology thing and they said, wait a minute. We're not just going to go marching blindly forward in this, you know, promise of digital nirvana. Let's stop and let's go back. And it's because they stopped and they went back that we're even looking at analog instruments. And that's amazing because when the analog instruments were designed and invented, we never got there. Quadraphonic sound never really happened. Uh, analog modular performance never really happened. And now we're looking at that. We're looking backwards and we're rediscovering what was there. And this is the promise of going forward in a new way. We're not there yet, but the kids are doing it. You know, even if that means, you know, Everything has to be in vinyl, you know, which is very hard on me because I play quadraphonic and doing a quad vinyl is, is not easy. I just released a quad vinyl and uh, it was a performance in Geneva. And it's, a, you know, it's a lot of work to do a quad vinyl, but the kids want vinyl. So, um, you know. <laughs> and why, why is it difficult? It's actually an old system because in the 70s, there were encoding and decoding systems for quadraphonic. So how you make a quad vinyl is that you encode it. They, in the old days, there was an SQ and a QS. Uh, you know, these were systems for, uh, you know, making quadraphonic. And then on the other end, you decode it. Now I, I can make a stereo compatible quadraphonic recording uh, or LP so you can play it as a stereo but if you decode it it will come out in quad hmm. which is what I want I also you know have to download digital files in very high quality that you can get and also play those in quadraphonic you know as I say there seems to be this passion for for vinyl that's the challenge is doing the quad vinyl. Doing a quad digital is not that difficult. You just have to, you know, download the quad files. What is the physical experience of using the Buchla like? It's alive. Uh, you know, I prefer, I think the performance experience is what I care about the most. And that's what I'm promoting, you know, live performance. You know, whether it's because the, the way the instrument is designed or how you compose for it. I'm in the, you know, the domain of live performance. So playing is, uh, it's exciting, you know, because you, you, it's not like, you know, a lot of tech performances became so kind of abstracted, you know, somebody would sit at their computer and hit play and a digital file would play. And, and that was, you know, a performance and you'd see the eyeballs over the, you know, MacBook and, and that was like, oh no, you know, it's so boring. But the thing about the bukla is <laughs> that it's a living instrument, you know, it gives back and it's dangerous. It's exciting, you know, when you play and it's immersive, you know, you're in the middle of all this sound and you're controlling it live and it's challenging keeps you on your toes. So there are good performances and bad performances. You know, fortunately, the machine has been working for the most part. I had one 
problem on my last tour where the tuning didn't work. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, oh. there's always a back, you know, plan B. If your tuning doesn't work, as I say, you can do a whole concert on white noise and percussive sounds and, the, you know, morphing from an ocean to a, you know, a jet plane or whatever it is, you know, all these percussive and expansive sounds that are in the white noise family. That's so interesting. Yeah. So, so it's, you were talking before about how um, conventional instruments are defined by physical constraints. Like there's only so fast you can play a piano. At, at some point there's like an inhuman speed that's not possible. And the buccal lacks that, but what it doesn't lack that conventional instruments have is that it's very high stakes. <laughs> if it breaks in the middle or, you know, it, it is possible to, mistakes is not the right word because that's not a very jazzy framing of it, but but it can go in a way that you didn't expect it to go or you didn't want it to go and you have to adjust live uh, as opposed to if you play more conventional electronic music, you press, press play, there's not that much that can go wrong unless the speakers blow out or something like that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Right. It's dangerous and it's alive and it's imperfect. Uh, so it keeps you, yeah, it keeps you on your feet. I mean, I know that digitally, electronically, you can make perfection. You can say, you know, I want my pitches to be perfect. In the system that I play, that's not the case. I mean, my tuning can take hours. I, I once studied Indian music and, you know, to tune a sitar takes 10 years, you know, you, you, <laughs> you can't even tune it. It's like, so, you know, um, I, I don't think that having everything on perfect perfection mode is the way to go. I mean, even Bukla himself, when I complained about the dual arbitrary function generator because I couldn't tune it, because it was not it was not linear, and this is a complex discussion. But I brought it over to him, and I said, "Look, you know, it, it I can get one octave in the middle." I said, "It won't tune," and he said, "Do something else." <laughs> <laughs> Tough luck. Right. How dare you bring your preconceived notions of what this machine should be doing, you know, to the machine. But I do think it's a dance. You know, it is a dance. You know, you want the machine to do certain things and you want to do what the machine wants to do. So it is a dance and you have to find that, you know, as I say, relationship. So I'm going to ask you just one one last question before we sign off. Um, what's what's something that you haven't seen someone try yet with electronic music? but you would be really interested and excited to see the results. One of the problems with traditional uh, symphonic venues, of course, is that they don't accommodate spatial sound. But I have performed in conventional theaters like the Barbican, and I even played at, uh, you know, perfect places, Royal Albert Hall in London, you know, this beautiful, you know, oval-shaped theater. But I think we need to bring this possibility, the spatial sound, into the more conventional venues. And then what we really need to do is design new approaches to our theater, our concert halls so that we can have these. I tried to get Avery Fisher Hall in New York uh, redesigned with uh, accommodating spatial electronic sound. And that was in the 70s. It didn't happen. Uh, they've redesigned it again. I don't think that the classical music world is aware yet of what's coming and what they need to prepare for. And a lot of it has to do with the the architecture of the spaces. Also, I think we need to be careful about overstating the issue. There's a lot of talk now in spatial music about the number of speakers. And I have, you know, 100 speakers. I have 50 speakers. I have, you know, what we're talking about is a, a kind of a generic option that can be upscaled and downscaled. 
I can play in quadraphonic and control my space, and it can be easily whatever up routed to 60 speakers or 100 speakers. We, we want to make the problem defined in a fundamental way so we don't get sidetracked making hugely elaborate statements that don't adapt to the needs. You know, if I'm doing a World's Fair and I want to have 200 speakers or whatever, all that's wonderful. But what we need is concert halls that can adapt to spatial sound in a very elastic way. That makes a ton of sense. The the concert hall is as much a part of the instrument as the bukla itself. Yeah. Uh, it, it's ultimately what holds the sound and reverberates. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, you know, maybe someday it'll all be done with headphones. I don't know. Uh, but I, I don't think we have to have just one choice. Thank you so much, Suzanne. This was a, a really fun conversation. Thank you, Devin. I really enjoyed it.